believers, non-believers, unaffiliated believers, sort of believers, and even you think I'm a believers, welcome. My non-university unstudents, welcome to the uncensored unprofessor. I'm genuinely happy to know you're not afraid of doing a little thinking with me today. This is my 200th public episode. 200! It seems like, what, two months ago that I was working on my first series, Faith vs. Reason? Like a bullet! 200! Yep, and 62 additional private podcasts for my monthly financial supporters. It's, it's kept me busy, engaged. 200. Today, I'm going to share with you reflections about the show, about me, since my transition out of being a full-time uh, tenured professor, and then I'm going to think with you about society and the church. But before all that, thanks. Thanks to every single person who ever downloaded a UU podcast. When churches invite me to preach, I always tell the priest or the pastor, it was a privilege and a pleasure to deliver the word. And the same is true with my podcast. It's a privilege, a pleasure to share Christ and his unique lenses with you. Hey, I'd love your support. I have subscriber friends giving me $2 a month. Please consider even a $2, $3 monthly pledge at P-A-T-R-E-O-N, Patreon. Help me pay for the show's production. Okay, first, the show. From observing my weekly, monthly numbers, here's what has happened with my podcast. I went from having a super wide net of listeners to a more narrowed audience. A few thousand students were curious to hear what I had to say. Maybe they'd only taken one class with me and they wondered what my show would be like. Then over the first couple years, that audience both narrowed and expanded. What do I mean? Some of hundreds, I'm not sure. Some of those former students of mine, I'm surmising here again from reviewing the numbers, many checked out. They didn't like how theological or philosophical or how small o orthodox of a Christian I am, and and that was the show's narrowing as they left. But the broadening? I've picked up hundreds more listeners who were not former college students of mine from around the world. And now, some three plus years in, I have a more committed, regular audience. It's been, it's been fun to watch, to interact, to grow. And the show continues to grow. But for as much as I want growth, my first and final calling is to be faithful. Regardless of how liked I am, faithfulness, it's one of the most consistent themes in the whole Bible. But one of the hardest things about podcasting, I can't see your faces, can't read your body language. When I was in the classroom, I was acutely aware of my students. I observed facial demeanors, body language, them hanging on my every word, the room's mood. None of that's possible during a podcast. So, I imagine... I imagine we're together, and I try to determine where you might be lagging. So after some run of theology or history, I'll inject some humor or, or a random reflection. I care that you're with me. Care that we're squeezing every drop of significance out of our precious time together. And laughing, it's a grand way to share life together. And, and on that relational front... Would you please give me your feedback? Email me at uncensoredunprofessor at gmail.com. I have four or five premium supporters who give me regular feedback, help me think through possibilities, point out things that don't really work, give me their suggestions, their book reading ideas. I'd treasure your feedback too. Again, email me at uncensoredunprofessor at gmail.com. Personally, 
Leaving my slot as a theology professor was tougher than I thought it'd be. Rougher. Theology is a consuming discipline. It's it's difficult not to have one's entire identity consumed. Not only not only by keeping up with the constant changes inside the field, trying to maintain expertise inside the discipline, but but also because you want, well, I wanted, desperately, to make every single class, every single session, be formative for my students. God had, in crystalline ways, called me to the classroom, and I, I wanted to shine brightly for Him. So my identity was much more plowed down into my role as a college professor than I realized. And it took me, and I'm sharing with my heart, you guys, today in ways I normally only reserve for my exclusive podcasts. You're welcome. Yeah, 200 is a good time to pause and reflect. It took me a good three years to stop agonizing over the massive missional slide the college had taken. Is taking. Three years to let go, to quit lamenting the massive bureaucratic hostile takeover that ground down into powder any last sense of Christian community that was so precious when first I was hired all those years ago. Took took me three years of living here in Sugar Beet Central to readjust my own existential orientation. Oh, oh man. Recently for coffee, I met with a local professor who, at an early age, is resigning his own tenured position at a Christian university. Well, now mostly Christian in name only, he's, he's leaving for many reasons I left my slot. I met him and talked with him about how hard his departure might be for him existentially, what it might mean for him to let go, to experience vocational termination, mercy. We men, we people, we get buried in our doing. Part of that's because God created us to work. But in that season, along the way, a profound Holy Spirit encounter happened to me. It's almost five years ago now. At church, the Anglican priest talked about how in Jesus' ministry, the tax collector, Matthew, experienced a kind of death when he let go his tax-stealing business. Taxation as a kind of theft? Geesh, same as it ever was. Jewish Matthew had to go through a vocational death to leave all that, to leave behind his entire identity, to turn and follow Christ his new master. And the priest in that poignant homily reflected on how much of our lives are comprised of deaths, plural. Each letting go, every meaningful goodbye can be a little death. We get connected to people. We get committed to locations. Our hearts get woven in the fabric of a geography, right? Sheesh, I mean, authors have been writing for centuries about how people's hearts get woven into the fabric of a local topography, how they find so dear the location where they live. And that priest, on a Sunday morning, he was speaking directly into my heart. His words burrowed down into my aching soul. Because at that time, I was only a few weeks out from turning my resignation into the provost. Nobody knew but my wife that I was going to do that. And I was already feeling the death pangs of having to let go, of following a new call from God, a new direction. And through the priest that cold morning, the Lord was telling me, It's all right. I am with you. This is me. Several months later, I was conversing one-on-one with the silver-haired priest. and Out on the church patio, I asked if he remembered that sermon, and he said, yeah, of course. And I said, did you realize that that morning you were looking directly into my eyes for chunks of that homily? He said, nope. I'm pretty, pretty focused on what I'm preaching, trying to convey. I said, well, yeah, your words, 
Your words were drilling down into my soul. You were God's mouthpiece to me in a season pregnant with the pangs of death, the pangs of letting go. He smiled and said, Isn't it fascinating how the Lord speaks into our lives like that? Yeah, I said. The Holy Spirit used your sermon to speak directly into my life in a season that was filled with separation, filled with a little death, and your words gave me peace. It was one of those God-ordained moments where I knew the Lord was with me, that He understood my sorrow, that He was walking out ahead of us as a family. Today, I spend about 30 hours a week podcasting, formatting, recording, editing, loading my podcast to the RSS feed host, reading, interacting with supporters, maintaining my webpage. And on the family front, Tanya and I have two grandkids, one girl, one boy. She's five, well, (laughs) sorry, she's five and a half, G-Pa, and a a one-year-old boy. Boys and girls are so different. People who say they're mere social constructions clearly haven't raised at least one of each. Schnikes. And I take care of our lawn, our roses, our beautiful but messy globe willow trees. Play golf with my 87-year-old dad who lives about 30 minutes away. Preach occasionally at churches. Do other hobbies like shooting guns and camping. Life is good. But enough about me. Let's talk about me. (laughs) No, no, that's enough. What about society, culture, the church? Hey, I'll get to that in a second, but an easy and free way to bless my UU endeavors? Leave a review at either Chartable, Google Play, YouTube, or iTunes. Okay, yeah, it's true. My podcast has taken a decidedly outspoken tack with respect to our societal foment. I will not apologize for my outspokenness. Because more, I believe the church should be leading in the middle of such seasons. The silent church... Russian gulag survivor Alexander Solzhenitsyn noted, the silent church, the tacit church, the, air quotes, politically neutral churches in Russia, they all got digested by the forces of godless Soviet culture. Being silent, they melded into the godless Soviet culture. Silence often equates to a kind of tacit acceptance. Me? No, not me. For most of my adult life, the the church has been silent. There's been a kind of benign neglect about the slide into ennui and meaninglessness and bitterness that our culture is chasing at a light speed pace. When I was a kid, the church would openly name evils from the pulpit, abortion, vile movies, the injurious effects of rotten TV shows, alcoholism, the danger of drugs, and they were right to challenge all that. But what they neglected, and, and and it's rather like how the parents, the church neglects what's going on in a Disney movie, right? I mean, my episode 150 was Samuel Lively, How the Mouse Snuck In, Disney and Christian Culture. That interview's still spot on for today. My boyhood church, like parents today, ignore, ignored the philosophic overlay of a Disney movie, of culture. They're happy to let their little ones watch since there's no exposed breasts or swear words or blood or gore. But, but the mood, the philosophy woven through a Disney story is more injurious to a kid's soul than an exposed breast could ever be. Teaching a child that they themselves are all they'll ever need? That's poison to the family. A relational murder. A soul killer. Teaching a child that all white men... Frozen too. Teaching that all white men are 
Evil is an insidious way to project reality. The progressive culture overlay is far more insidious than a vulgar, vulgar swear word or an exposed breast could ever be. And today, society is being washed out with sameness. And while all that's going on, too much of the church is mute, tacit, benignly neglecting to sound the alarm, failing to compare and contrast the vivid, Christ-centered way with a vapid, rootless, truthless, secular, progressive way of life. Ennui. My mom, on a recent visit to her place on the Willamette River, Oregon, my mom remarked briefly on this dynamic. She said to me, and it was, it was briefly before she sang a couple karaoke songs in the living room, she said, we're in the middle of a great washout. And I thought on my long drive back home, Mom's right. People's souls are being washed out. Local restaurant flavorings washed out by chain restaurants. Mom and pop small town businesses washed out by the Amazonification of, of commodity. Church distinctives they are nearly non-existent from church to church, almost exactly the same inside the same town I know because I enjoy going and visiting dozens of churches in a town. Denominational distinctives are being washed out. I mean, Baptists, our Christian Missionary Alliance, our Charismatics, our Lutherans are all seeker-sensitive, are all sadly vanilla Goo. Regional idiosyncrasies washed out. Even local hymnody washed out. Smashed thin by a sameness, a, a wispy thin recipe of culture. Are you kidding me? There are no local Christian musicians who could write something surpassing a one inch deep me and my emotions. Song, it's a stab in my soul. But the, the sine qua non qualities of a once vibrant local Christian community, they're being washed out. You, my listener, you could probably list off all the reasons for the great washout, media chiefly, and ever tethered to that, capitalism. Although I gotta be honest, in careful philosophical surveys I've read, I've come to realize that the whole sweep of human philosophy, which therefore means the whole sweep of human nature, the whole sweep of human philosophy swings between the extremes of a kind of chaotic sprawl and a monolithic and stultifying uniformity, oneness. Across history, things are either spinning out of control into anarchy or being coerced toward a lifeless and monochrome unity. Today, the clamor for diversity is itself weirdly monochromatic. Lifeless, joyless, humorless, hate-filled, rage-driven. Amen? Who do you see that's inviting you into diversity? No, they're demanding it. You equally love everyone no matter what, or we will barbecue your soul. For all the clamor for diversity today, what's really being pushed and what's adamantly being promoted is a cold and heartless sameness. We all need to be one. We are the world. We all need to act the same and talk the same. No, we all need to think the same. If you don't think the way I do, you're a hater. Can't we all just get along? Can't we all just think the way that the powers tell us to? Can't? Can't we all just be me? It's oneness, singularity, all washed out in a sea of ugly gray. To wit... Truth. Truth is being washed out by the belief that truth is a mere social construction, even though that's its own convenient construction, and, and that construction is ever directed to 
dissociate us from the past, which means dissociate us from a Judeo-Christian worldview, which means to dissociate us from things eternal. They chant, follow your truth, but it can only lead to ennui. Or love. Love is being washed out by the teaching that we that we each need to create our own love. <laughs> As if there are 8 billion different kinds of loves possible in a world of human finite corporeal existence. Or beauty. Beauty is being washed out by the belief that each person is a universe unto herself, unto zerself. Each person were being bombarded. Each person should determine what is beautiful. Holy God. No wonder art shows are convocations of drivel, drool, paint thrown onto canvas and given the caption, Meet my favorite social construction, Larry. So ugly. Holiness? Holiness has been so washed out. Tomate sagrados. Holiness has been so washed out, it not only amounts to nothing in Western culture, it amounts to nothing in most of the evangelical churches. God is good? Oh, yes. God is love? Yes, please. May I have seconds? But God is holy? Crickets. Even Ben Shapiro gets this about holiness. He said we're all being encouraged to sin in public, but practice our religion in private. I love that line when he said it, because it's so true. We're all being encouraged to sin in public, but practice our, our religion in private. It's a chilling reversal, a chilling dissociation, a killing reversal, washout. We are in the middle of a gigantic washout. What all the faceless forces want? Sameness. Vanilla goo. A Christian podcast? I appreciate all the help I can get. Prayers for the Lord's favor and provision, social media shares, or telling a friend about the show. All sincerely appreciated. I just finished reading a collection of stories by Flannery O'Connor, a Catholic who lived in the Deep South. She died at the age of 39 from lupus in in 1964 in Georgia. Now, i got to be honest. I don't commend her to you. Her stories, well, at least in this compilation, her stories were uniformly dark, dreary, frequently funny, yes, and poignant, yes, but commonly, usually morose. Reading through, my hope wasn't fueled. I didn't even see her religious faith being woven into the stories. Well, (laughs) not unless she was some stark Augustinian who was emphasizing the fallenness of human contingency. You have nothing to contribute to your own salvation except the sinfulness that drove you to it. (laughs) That's pretty stark. But what she did offer us variety, diversity, particularities. Every character was unique. This one with a prosthetic leg, that one with a hole in his head. She had black uncaring eyes. He enjoyed taking a lit cigarette stub into his closed mouth for a few seconds. She couldn't bear the thought of getting pregnant. But this other lady, she viewed everyone as somehow every she viewed everyone as somehow under her loving care. He pretended to love a mom's young derelict daughter just so he could steal the mother's car when they eloped together. Those young boys, Henri runaway opportunists. This girl was attractive but mute. Yeah. Flannery O'Connor portrayed a mute character and refreshingly she presented that character to us without any sense of pity or patronizing. The mute was a person. It was so perfect. O'Connor's characters in the course of a single day are capable of exhibiting the most warm and inclusive actions and the most unimaginable betrayals. 
such rich diversity. Was that, is that because Flannery had such a vivid or rich imagination, or, and I think this is more likely, that in her early 20th century world, there just was more diversity? More diversity or idiosyncrasy? Did you ever hear the phrase, the devil's in the details? It's normally presented as a way of saying, oh, about the fine print of a contract or the tiny font of a legal agreement, that all the gotchas, all the ways you're secretly being screwed, are burrowed down inside the finer points. But, you guys, so is the beauty. So is the holiness. Not, please not, Not that everything peculiar is therefore beautiful. Goodness, a a great deal of peculiarity is just odd. But that it is the particular, the the idiosyncratic, that often is a vehicle for the wonderful, a container of the beautiful. The devil is in the details? Yeah. So, too, usually is the beauty, the meaning, the truth. And all that idiosyncrasy is being erased forcibly washed out. And that's despite all the progressive clamor for diversity. (laughs) Movies that try to depict this monstrously uniforming soul choker, The Matrix, 1999, of, of course. Good evening, Mr. Anderson. Planet of the Apes, 1968, and the other originals in that in that string. Gattaca, 1997. Genetically engineering society. Equilibrium, minority report, both from 2002. District 9, from 2009. No, there really isn't any room for aliens. And then Idiocracy, 2006. It was a humorous take. I can't tell you how prescient that movie was for how sweepingly retarded our own era is. Or from literature? I just read the first 80 pages of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Published in 1932, Huxley could see into 2021. He understood not only human nature, but he understood the way that the powers perpetually want to throttle, consume, pin down diversity. The powers promote sameness. Sameness they can manage. A flat gray uniformity that they can get their rules and norms and chemical addictions around all of that. But thinking outside the box, and Huxley's already shown us that, thinking outside the box, dangerous. Asking questions, blasphemous. Believing that people, instead of governmental powers, can fix things, incredulous. I wish I could enjoy a cup of coffee with Mr. Huxley. I'd love to thank him, pick his brain. He saw this faceless monster coming 90 years ago, and he poked its eye. How else? Where else do we witness the washout? Really? Wow. Um, okay, folks. Studio producer tells me that the Center for Disease Control has a new update on how to thrive in our COVID world. And you know me, normally I like to I like to paraphrase things, but with government reports, I think it's best just to read their own words. So here you go. I'll read to the American citizenry from the CDC. Advisory. Science is back. Yes, the vaccination process continues to move forward at the speed of, well, fast. Approximately 30% of Americans have now been vaccinated, so henceforth you need only verify 70% of what we say. (laughs) Science is back. 
Furthermore, we have not a single independent testing process from which we may draw that clarify the long-term effects, years from now, of the two RNA-modifying vaccines now available from Pfizer or Moderna, but trust us, you have nothing to worry about. Science is back. In fact, the only tests we have available on the likely long-term effects of the RNA modifiers are from the pharmaceutical companies themselves. And, hey man, why on earth would a pharmaceutical company present bad information to us? We're scientists from the government. Like Moderna, we would never share misinformation or bad information or non-information. Our calling both as scientists and public servants, precludes our ever sharing erroneously, science is back. Gosh, you guys, I'm surprised they're saying all this like this. That's not, not how I've come to understand scientific reporting, but who am I to ask questions? I'm just a regular guy. I don't work in a lab. Well, I guess I just better be respectful and obey. Let me, let me keep reading. Yes, it has been verified that 98.5% of those infected with COVID-19 have survived. But trust us, science is back. You have not one reason to refuse a vaccine that was rushed to the public in a year be clouded with contradictory governmental reports, a season steeped in fan-flamed societal tumult, tumult, and vaccines quick draw developed amid an election year where nearly everything imaginable was being twisted and manipulated for political gain. Still, you can trust us. Science is back. We only have your best interests at heart. In fact, we're fond of saying, we're here from the government, and we're here to help. One more CDC fact. We are pleased to report that recent foreign nation-conducted tests empirically show that a social distancing measure of three feet is now all that is required for gatherings. Three feet. Previously, we mandated a six-foot social distancing policy because six-foot is the distance of several common epidemiological scientific measures. Things like a Major League Baseball's batter's box depth, the length of a yo-yo champion's string, and the average distance between houses in Irvine, California. Aware of those kind of scientific commonalities, we here at the CDC landed on six feet because that is as close as any of us wanted to get to any actual scientific peer-reviewed studies of the COVID virus over the last 12 months. So once again, just three feet. Science is back! Trust us. You can trust us. We would never contradict our own press releases. Finally, as Dr. Fauci likes to say, thank you for your unquestioning compliance. Yeah. Hmm. Well, there you have it, folks. Another straightforward info blast from CDC's Ministry of Truth. And me? Heard. I heard that. I heard that. Man, I sure am giddy to know that science is back. I heard that. Politics would never run rampant over science. Whew. What else? Let me get back to thinking with you. What else does the washout mean? For all of its clamor that it's something somehow fresh, cancel culture is not different from the great washout I'm lamenting today. Cancel culture acts like it is promoting something new. But the truth it is as old as it gets. Eliminate variety. Smash flat the particular. Our great contemporary washout has morphed into cancel culture. So then, what's novel about all this? It's the first time in American history that the progressives are open about it. There's no apology. They mean to overtake culture. They're showing their teeth in every grimacing, 
leering glare, they are racing to overtake education. They're canceling left and right, up and down. Under the guise of, air quotes, protecting us from hate speech, they mean to shut down freedom of speech. How far can it go without a major backlash? My sure can't predict, but I believe massive foment is racing at us. Man, I hope I'm wrong. What else is novel about this? It's becoming public policy. Oh, you guys, this is not one more political hiccup in a national history full of political hiccups. (laughs) As if this is just one more power grab. It's not that simple. As if this is just another screaming match in D.C. It's not that simple. It has teeth. It has energy. It has a seething and insatiable rage. What does this mean for the church? Well, first, I hope it means there is a great sifting on on the verge. Churches across the country, due to the COVID-produced fiscal crisis, across the country, churches are closing. Me? I believe we have too many churches, and too many churches that are exactly the same, all focused strictly on numeric growth or focused on melding into the Wokarati. Neither will abide. No, a sifting is upon us, and I welcome it. Second, this is the time for churches to stand out, to go bold, to to, to, to boldly proclaim Christ and the biblical vision for reality for persons. When and where your pastor touches on themes like that, I urge you, go up and thank him, encourage him. Pray daily for your pastors. Pray daily for your priests. When he speaks directly about sin, thank him personally. When he touches on, when he touches on our societal washout, encourage him. Pastors take big gut punches for saying hard things. People get pissy and complain. People leave. Go up and encourage him. Third, strengthen the things that remain, Revelation 3.2. Strengthen your family. Strengthen, educate your children. Strengthen your faith. Dig in. This is not the time to be apathetic. This is not the time to check out. We Christ followers? Leslie Newbigin said that we Christ followers are called to be patient revolutionaries. Unlike our frenetic and dizzying cancel culture, we are patient. We know it doesn't have to happen in one day. It doesn't have to happen in one year. It doesn't even have to happen in our lifetime. We are patient. But like revolutionaries... We are committed. We see the end game, the return of Christ the Lord to redeem all of creation, planet Earth, and culture included. So strengthen that which you have. Dig into your faith like never before. And then fourth, and I open with this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up with it too, be faithful. There's not one thing, nothing, There's nothing more important than your being faithful. Where you are, who you are. Committed to biblical truth, biblical morality, goodness, biblical beauty and holiness. Committed to character. We need to have our identities ever attuned to the crucified Christ. The great washout is upon us. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. But greater is he who is in all of us than that washout which is in the world. Thanks so much, you guys, for listening and thinking with me. God bless you and your families. May the Lord bless and empower you in prayer. Please go now. Turn everyone, turn your beautiful God-given brains on.